Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the Word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. Praise God. Now, we had started a series on uh, seed time and harvest time. Praise God. I read from Genesis, and I said, for as long as the earth remained, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, right? Uh, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. He said it shall not cease. It will never stop. Do you understand? And I said that you don't have control over cold and heat. You wake up in the morning and it's cold. And you wake up in the afternoon and it's hot. You understand? That's the weather. You don't have control over summer and winter. It's summertime, it's winter time. You will not have control over day and night. Those are constants. This is day, and night is surely going to come. There's not going to be a day where night is not going to be there on the face of the earth. In certain places, it might be day. In certain places, it might be night. There are certain places where it's day for a long time. There's a place somewhere in Europe where it's like the sun shines the whole month. Yeah. But, on that part of the world it might not be, but there is somewhere on the face of the earth where darkness is and the night is. You understand? So, as long as the earth remains, I told you that those are constant. And I said, you don't have control over the day and the night, you don't have control over summer and winter, you don't have control over cold and heat, you don't have control over any of those elements of the earth. But you have control over seed time and harvest. And I told you that that is your window of opportunity for you to have results in the spirit. He told you for as long as the earth remains, what you sow is what you reap. You remember that? And I went further to explain the dynamics of what it means to sow beyond simply money and seed, which is also part of, a, of it, but there is way more in that than just the basic thing we call giving, which is just sowing, which is good, it's important, it's an integral part of the, of the gospel, but it's not the only part of seed. Some people, when you talk about seed, they only think about money. But seed can be in many forms and many ways. It can come in many ideas and understandings. Seed can vary. It's all a form and, and pattern of giving. Praise the Lord Jesus. So I told us that in this opportunity of life, you have seed time, the time for seed. Do you understand? And the consequent harvest that follows your seed. Be not deceived, the Bible says, you reap what you sow. What you sow is what you reap. Praise God. Harvest means result. Are you following me? Harvest means result. Some reap 30, some reap 60, some reap hundredfold. But all of it is a harvest. The money that is coming in your pocket right now is a harvest. You understand? The children that are coming your way is a harvest. The blessings that are coming your way are a form of a harvest. You understand what I'm saying? The promotions that, you're, that are coming your way are a form of a harvest. The deals that are going to come in your life as a business person, they are as a form of a harvest. The results that come in the ministry as we multiply and grow, all of that is a harvest. Do you understand what I'm saying? And all of that has a precedence, which is seed time. The time and opportunity that you have to sow that seed. The time and opportunity that you have to seize that moment in the spirit that translates to the results that you have. Praise God. The holistic line of understanding that seed time and harvest those are the only windows. Seed time is the only window in Scripture for you to have 
predictable results in the sense that you can get to a point where you know that you know that you know that you know that results are coming. Where you, you don't even to worry and say, hey God, maybe, no. There's a point where you get in God, where you are sure that you're sure that you're sure that what you've believed him for is going to work. Praise the Lord. And I explain to you what it means to sow to the Spirit. And he says, if you sow of the Spirit, you'll reap life eternal. But if you sow of the flesh, he says, you shall reap corruption. Corruption means stuff starts to die around you. Your finances die, your spirit starts to feel like it's dying, your relationships die, your everything starts to die. You need to know how seed time works. You understand? Today I want to also interest you in another part of seed time. Okay? John chapter 20. Yokana chapter 20. Verses 19. The Bible says the same day at evening... Being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Right? And the Bible says, And then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Okay? Now, and when he had said it, to his disciples, the Bible says, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Praise God. And when he breathed on, breathed on them, and he says, Receive ye on the Holy Ghost, whosoever sins ye remit, he says, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. And the next verse, 24, says, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the prints of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Praise God. And the time comes later, where Jesus comes to Didymus, Thomas, and then tells him, Touch my palms, because you need to believe. He touches the palms of Jesus, and then he what? He believes. Now, this portion of scripture, of course, I believe many of you have read before, but and have not maybe put it in, in retrospect to, to the big affair in this story. And that is, the disciples of Jesus have a unity of spirit, okay? They are fellowshipping together. They are in the oneness of the spirit. They are seeking God. Of course, there were threats without Okay? Uh, the Jews wanted to kill them. Why? Because Judaism doesn't believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. So they don't believe that Jesus came in the flesh. So they have an issue with guys who are saying that Jesus is even alive. That's even worse. We killed a chap for calling himself God. Now there's people that are purporting, insinuating that the man is alive. There's a problem. Praise God. There's a what? There's a problem when you start to tell us that the man is alive. So, they run and hide themselves. The Bible says Jesus stood. He didn't knock the door. What a wonderful experience. They were there, worried, and Jesus appeared. Praise God. He, 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 the doors were shut, and then Jesus came and stood in the midst. The doors were shut, and Jesus came. The doors were shut. Do you get the point? The doors were shut, and Jesus came. So the, it's not that the, he knocked on the door. No, the doors were shut and Jesus appeared. You understand? And he told them, peace be unto you. And when he spoke to them, he said, even, now listen, even, even as my father has sent thee, send I you. How has he sent me? He has sent me with power. I send you with power. He has sent me with glory. I send you with glory. He has sent me with peace. I send you with peace. He has sent me in splendor. I send you 
in splendor. He has sent me with demonstration of power. I send you in the demonstration of the power of God. As he has sent me, send I you. Send I you. This is Jesus talking to his disciples in a fellowship of an appointment that was ordained by God as they were led in one way or another, they were led to be together at that particular time of fellowship. Are you, are you following what I'm saying? At that particular time of fellowship, they were together. They were serving God. They were, they were in the presence of God. They were seeking God because there was fear without. You understand? He did not tell them what time he was coming. They just seized the window of opportunity in the spirit. Okay? And Jesus comes to them and tells them, Peace be unto you. And he tells them, As my Father, as he has sent me. He says, Send I you, even so. Send I you. You know, to the same degree, to the same glory, in the same anointing, in the same power, in the same mind, in the same wisdom, in the same everything the Father has sent me. I send you. And what does the Bible say? He breathed on them and told them, receive the Holy Ghost. At that point, they received the portion of the Spirit of impartation to go even as the Father had sent Jesus. You understand? And the Bible says, Thomas, which is called Didymus, was not around. Thomas was not around. Was he a disciple of Jesus Christ? Yes. Thomas was a disciple of Jesus Christ. He was a lover of the Son of God. You remember when Lazarus died? And then Jesus was going to raise him? In fact, one time in scripture, Didymus says, let us go with him and die with him if we have to. Thomas loved God. He loved the Son of God. You understand? But for some random reason, that day, Thomas was not around. Do you understand what I'm saying? So he comes back. And he's doubting, he's not around, God is Jesus, is not alive. I don't, I doubt it. He, of course, is right not to believe. He has not seen much. He has to touch the palms of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But in the history of the church as we know it, that was the last time we had of any exploit on the life of Thomas. We never had anything about Thomas from that day. That was the last time Thomas was mentioned by the Spirit. Why? Simple truth. Where was Thomas at the point of impartation? <laughs> so, when we're talking about seed time, okay, let's, let's put it in the pretext of, of church, service. Because Luke 8, 11 tells you that the seed is the word of God. Isn't it? The seed is the word of God. The seed is the word of God. The, the parable is that the seed is the word of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? That word which is spoken, the Bible says it is spirit and it is life. You understand? The word appeared to the disciples in the absentia of Thomas, which was a disciple. And and a supposed deserve of this blessed grace because he was qualified even prior. Of course Jesus knew. He says, I know who shall betray me. I know who shall believe not. He knew. He says, for I know. He knew among them who will believe not and who shall betray. He knew. You understand? But when all of them walk away from a state, did you understand what I'm saying? And when Thomas stayed, he loved Jesus. But for some random reason, Thomas does not understand seed time. He doesn't understand seed time. 
Who has understood what I'm saying? Okay, let me make it simpler for you. If the parable is that the seed is the word of God, hmm? the window you have is when you can avail yourself for the opportunity to hear the word of God. Because a man of the spirit carries the grace to speak an impartation upon your life as recorded by heaven only to the degree that you are available. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not talking about, because it's two way. You remember when the Bible says that forsake not the assembling in, in, in Hebrews 10, 25. He says forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. Let's read, let's read it. One, two, three, let's go. One, two, three, read. One. Mm -hmm. Mm. Mm -hmm. You understand? He says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. We don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Some people attend service when they want. And some don't attend service. I was talking to a minister the other day who told me, uh, me, I don't fellowship. I, I stay in my room and God speaks to me. <laughs> I said to my heart, this man is going to die. This man is going to die. The Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of ourselves. Don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. This is the reason why you're still alive. Both physically and spiritually. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Don't forsake it. Don't stay away from fellowship. Don't, don't abandon fellowship. Don't pray when you can. The Greek word there for forsaking is, is enkatalipo, enkatalipo. It has two forms of definition, forsaking. It has two forms of definition. If you go in the third definition, it means to abandon or desert or live in streets, right? At one point, he's speaking of the group of people who just desert fellowship. They abandon it. They don't just congregate. There are people who simply don't congregate. They just don't congregate with others. Huh? They just don't believe in that order. For them, they have the Holy... No, the Holy Spirit with an aura. They have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Me with the Holy Spirit has not told me. If the Holy Spirit hasn't led me to go to church, I don't go to church. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the first definition is to abandon, to live in straight, to live helpless, to totally abandon, to utterly forsake. Some people forsake the fellowship. They forsake this order. Listen, the government of heaven has told you how to grow. And he has told you one of the ways to grow is fellowship. You can't run away from that responsibility and then believe God for growing. Seed time, the time where you sit and share the seed, the word of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because it's telling you, for as long as the earth remains cold and heated, but seed time. Or as long as you are still alive, never forsake the assembling together of brethren. Don't forsake coming to church. You understand? Don't abandon the fellowship of ministers. You get it? Sometimes I've found people who change ministries. There are some who do, and I beat them well. And I tell them, you know what? Go. Even me in my heart, I know. Except the Lord draw you, you can't come. But there are people who live and I know they've made a mistake. Because they don't even belong where they go. You see what I'm saying? They don't, they don't belong where they go. But some people are very unstable. Very unstable. They can be tossed by any wind. You just tell them, ah, now banange. there's Coca-Cola there. Ah, Pepsi. Ah. What? Pepsi? I'm not just a Pepsi. Ah, Pepsi! You understand? 
They're like that. And that is more so in the church of East Africa. When you go to West Africa, they understand submission very clearly. West Africans don't have that eh? hoping, eh? No, no, no. When they are submitted to a man of God, they are submitted to a man of God. Whether he's black or white, small or big, when they are submitted to a man of God, they are submitted to a man of God. They understand that pattern. But come to the East African part. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. There's a demon. There are people that they attend like 17 meetings a week. You, you get my point? Yes, fellowship is good, but also... God has ordained where you ought to fellowship. He has ordained it. Your boundary of habitation, it's called. He has given you a boundary of habitation to say, look, you'll grow under here. Not everybody can speak to you. Oh, if you think everybody can, then you have not yet understood how the things of God work. You need to sit under a priest under which you can account. Or if the ministry is so big that you can't reach the priest, at least be accountable to the immediate person in that ministry. That's the order of the church. But some people, they want here, me if I want here, I go. Me if the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, and you're broke, you're beggarly, you're failing. Everything on your life is failing. But you're convinced that you're hearing God. And such people don't have results. They never have results. They will never have results. They will never have results. They will never have results. Do you understand what I'm saying? They will never have results. A couple of years ago, there is a young girl that was misled out of fellowship. I know her. She was misled out of fellowship. And somebody told her foolish things, and then she believed them about the ministry, and then she left. And I started to pray for her. As a man of God, as a father will pray for their child. I did. The Lord knows. Two years down the road, I heard the story of this young girl. I, the man of God in me started weeping because she had lost it. The last friends that I'd seen her told me she had gotten to the age of running mad and she still doesn't get it. The kid was sober in ministry. But some of the spirits sat on her one random day and deceived her. And the next I'm hearing, oh, your daughter almost ran mad. They found her somewhere. She, was, she had lost her brain. And I said to myself, now the person who deceived her, will God use a baseball bat to beat him? <laughs> because me, I'm every day I understand the mercy of God and I'm like, you understand, eh? And you know, as ministers of the gospel, much as all of this happens, we are regarded to walk in love, you see? Because love is the royal law. But number two, faith worketh by love. You cannot function in a certain level of faith to do signs, miracles, and wonders, the potence of the Spirit, when you have not understood perfection in love. Don't be deceived. Faith works with love. When you have not understood the revelation of love, agape, in your spirit, you will never walk in faith like you ought to. Faith works by love. So that is why many of you who are trying to believe God for mighty exploits and you have failed to do miracles, you have failed to walk in the power of God, question your love life. Chances are that there is a big problem in that equation. Because when I understood love, I started to see the miraculous. When I understood love, I started to see answered prayer. Some of you, your prayers don't even have results on them because your faith does not work with love. And the reason why I kept praying for her is because I loved her as a father would love their own child. You understand? I know pastors would be like, uh-huh. Yes, yes, let her run mad. Yes, yes, yes. I told her, did I tell you? Did I tell you? For them all they do is, did I tell you? Because did I tell you? It's more important for them, for somebody to die and they say, oh, did I tell you? Because for them it's more important that they told you. 
so that they create a form of fear. You understand? And strange allegiance around them because so that you fear them and then start submitting to them by fear. That's not so. It's not what I'm trying to tell you. I did not glory in what happened to this young girl. I bruised in my heart because a man of God misled her. Do you understand? And she gave up from the covering where God had called her. Some people confuse me. Someone comes and tells you, one week, God has told me to submit under you. After one month, God has told me to release me. I don't think. The same God who spoke last month has changed his mind after one month. Then you ask them, why? Because I need purpose. Once I see that, I'll release you in peace. Because, by the way, whether they are lying or not, I've never held any man. I have never. The Lord is my witness. When a man says, God has told even when I know they are wrong, I don't give my opinion. If they were seeking it, I would give it. But here they are informing me. You get, you get my point? If somebody says, I feel like God is leading me elsewhere. We can pray about it and I even tell you, you know what, I feel God is leading you there. I will release you in peace. But when you come and tell me, I want to unsubmit or to be released, there you're informing me. You understand? That means you don't regard any opinion there. I just, I speak a blessing upon your life. You understand? And I say, Mokama. Because, you know, as a man of God, you might also hold on to someone who will destroy you. <laughs> you get, that's what killed Moses. God told Moses, let me kill these people and make you others. Moses, <laughs> Moses said, nada, you can't kill them for me. I love them. What? What? So God is like, but Moses, do you love these people like I do? Trust me, these people are going to kill you. No, I love them. What happened? The Bible says they stirred him to disbelief. And he strikes the rock three times. And the Magais enter. Their descendants enter. And the chap stays on Mount Nebo and God, they don't even give him a decent burial. But because of people, ah, God. What? Eh? Go. Praise God. Some people, if you hold on to them, they kill you. I've called some and I told them, you know, peacefully, look for another person to pastor you. Please, just. I, I don't have the grace because I've followed every pattern of principle and it has never been well with those kinds of people. I have never seen any of them end well. Never. It has never been well with those kinds of people. The kind you release, not because it's their time or that they have to be, but because they have failed under the government of God. Now, if you fail under the government of God, why are you going to thrive? Why, why do you deceive yourself that somehow you're going to prosper? If God has said fellowship is where I want you. You see, there are simple scriptures we read. Eh? Yeah? Simple things eh? we read. Eh? Like in, in Matthew 18, 20, where he says that for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I shall be in their midst. That thing is powerful. It's powerful. When people come in the name of Jesus, He's available. Isn't he available to you as an individual? Yes, he is. But he's saying that there's a degree of my presence when men fellowship. Different from the degree of presence when you are alone. It is different. It will always be different. Are you following what I'm saying? Are you getting what I'm saying? So, I'm, I'm, I'm having this challenge of... If I see that I, I will not understand this person and... You know, we, for, for us, we follow process. We don't just wake up and say, go. No, we talk to you, bring two people, bring three, four. After the third time, we tell you, you know what? Go to another man of God. We don't say, go, never come. No, we tell you, go. If you, we, we feel you shouldn't return, we tell you, don't return. If we feel you should go, we, but we, we want you to go to another man. We, I prefer releasing you to another man of God and say, you know what? Me, if I failed, maybe a certain man has grace. Do you understand what I'm saying? So anyway, but there are those who have left and it was the will of God and you pray for them. And they, then there are those, even those who don't even respect, they just go. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Some 
live where God has ordained them, and some leave even the whole concept and idea of fellowship. That is what they call to live helpless. To live in straight, it means to live the wrong way. Hmm? Now, the second definition of forsaking is to leave behind a man. To leave behind a man. That means it's part of the things you consider, but it's priority behind others. Eh? Do you understand what I'm saying? That's forsaking the fellowship. Some of you, you come any time. You, you enter service any time. You enter the church of Jesus Christ any time. You're not late for interviews. You're never late for interviews. You're never late for flights. What will you reach two hours earlier? Kumanga chi? Nyonyi. Nyonyi. You're never late for interviews. You're never late for flights. You're never late for the dates. If Peter says, let's meet at 7 p.m. at Arirang. You're at Arirang. 6.30. You're at what? You don't want to give any chance of losing out. Because Peter might think you're taking him for granted. And then looks for another timekeeper. Hello? You're never late for burial. When they say they bar at 4 p.m., you've never come late when you're burying dead bodies. Never and more. You've never been late when they're burying dead bodies. If they say burial is at 4, you must be there at 2. Do you understand what I'm saying? Then you come in church service at your time. You enter service at your time. And some of you, it's not a one-off. No, you're occasional at karma. But there are people who have children too like you. You get my point? You get my point? Thomas missed out on God because he was not available at the time when Jesus was commissioning the disciples. Listen to the word he spoke to them. He said, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Even so, send I you. And the Bible says, but Thomas, which is Didymus, was not with them. At the time when Jesus was speaking that impartation. Some of you, that's how the devil has kept you in bondage. The word you need, you're simply delayed. You're delayed. What should have benefited you came 10 minutes earlier? Because fellowship was among those. You left it behind among the other priority. You understand what I'm saying? There are people sometimes who enter, or some people have seen, people have seen and I'm like, I wish this person was here just five minutes earlier. This word was there. And I know it in my spirit. But who am I? Should I call you and tell you, you, you should have been... No, 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 no. I feel in my spirit it has passed. Because that's what Rema is. It's the now word. It's what you receive when you are available. Church, let's get into a culture of being in time for seed time. If you should be late, let it be explainable. But let it not be because you simply woke up eh, and ironed at your time, bathed at your time, tied your daughter's hair at your own time. Women. Huh? Do you get where I'm coming from? Thomas missed the timing of heaven to receive one of the most powerful impartation of his destiny because he was not there when Jesus 
was breathing the Spirit on his disciples. And that was the last we heard of Thomas. So Thomas's end was a place where he didn't have a harvest. We, we don't hear him as a continuation like we, we hear John or Peter or, or Mark or Luke or whoever they are. We, but, but Thomas doesn't know that God, Jesus, was not going to wait for him. No, the time of the impartation was available. Seed time has been accorded to you for your harvest. You want to come any time to church, and then you just want to raise your hands and just say, God, just power. And somehow you expect that a certain impartation is going to come eh, and locate you, Mukaziwa, too. And get you. That is why you're struggling in the things of results. Because you take God among others. You take fellowship, service among others. My point is, your man of God should never come before you on the altar. The word must find you. You're not supposed to find it. Because that means you're telling God, yes, you're important, but me, those last five minutes are the ones that are important for me. Or the last 35, they, for them, they are the ones that will work for me. Apostle can speak to the rest. These, those ones are not important. And then you want to convince God in this whole equation that you're serious about the things of the Spirit. This word is Spirit. When you come late to eat, you are telling the Holy Spirit that I don't regard you that much. You're not that important. You're among. You, I, I leave you behind among. You're among the surviving things. Do you understand what I'm saying? You're telling, because it is spirit and life. You are saying no to the life of God. You are robbing yourself of the full reward of life and spirit. And then you ask yourself why your life is incomplete. Again, I say, your man of God should never get on the pulpit before you. The word of God should never get on the pulpit before you. You have to be waiting upon the word. The word is not supposed to be waiting upon you. Jesus is not supposed to be waiting on you. You are supposed to be waiting on Jesus. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, because... You're entering at the point when an impartation has already been spoken. You don't know at what point the word that was needed has been put. And like I said, if the devil knows that you can't benefit by one word spoken in your spirit, he will put a certain thing around you, a certain deception around you, a certain laxity around your spirit, a certain irresponsibility on your soul, and then cause you to leave behind among, to make fellowship among, to make seed time among, to put God among, behind other things. Because you know, at that particular point, you will maybe come in at the point when what you needed has been imparted in another. And then some of you ask yourself, why is my life let me tell you, the Lord is my witness. I have a certain respect for the word. Watch me. One, some of you one day try to observe me when I'm listening to another man of God and see how I attend to the word. Because it is spirit and it is life. Watch me when I'm listening to a man of God. Watch me when I'm listening to the word. More so someone who adds on me. Do you understand what I'm saying? But watch when I'm responding to the word. And you see, like sometimes you sit in church and then you see people talk. Both. You have a lot of conversations outside church. 
you have a lot of time after it's dark. You have a whole week. This hour is for the Holy Spirit. It's for the Holy Spirit. You can do everything else the way you want it after service. Walk out and jazz. No, no, it's okay if you're simply carrying the person wobble. I was meditating on that. That's all right. Oh, man, he's spoken something that I can relate with. That's right. That's okay. It's two seconds, and then you focus on the word. But there are people, they are occasional. Like, again, I'm a pastor, I know. There are people who, they, they, even when they're in the presence of God, they don't regard the presence of God. They don't regard the word. They don't regard, they don't attend. They do everything they can. Yes. You understand it? Someone comes in service, they call them, they go out, they answer calls, then they come back, then they say, text them, where are you? What are you doing? What? After here? So what? When? Wow! You even hide the phone because you don't want your neighbors to see that you text. What is so, so, so important that you have to tell Jesus, wait. Who is there? Robert is messing up your head. Mama, this is Jesus. He married you before Robert knew you. Robert can wait. Are you hearing me? Rita can what? Wait. One time I went to a place in Machin. Yeah, I was called for a conference there. In there, I reached and I was going to start preaching. And I started ministering. In the middle of the service, the power of God was great that day. And I remember I stood on that pulpit, and in a vision I saw a young man. And that young man was called Isaac. And the Lord told me the name. And I stood in front of that pulpit and I said, the Lord has showed me a young man called Isaac. He was here since morning. And in the afternoon, the Lord had told me, that very day that when Isaac came in that very meeting and it came as a vision as I was preaching so in a vision I said I see in a vision that there was a young man called Isaac he was here since morning and he left about an hour before I came in and the Lord told me that his moment his moment was now the pastor has seen said Isaac came to me and pleaded and said, let me go. I have some commitments. The pastor told me I pleaded with Isaac to stay. Isaac refused. And the spirit revealed to me there was nothing serious Isaac was going to do. Nothing. The pastor stood on the pulpit and started crying. He said, I told Isaac, don't leave. What was the possibility of me coming after one hour after Isaac had gone and I pick that exact name and I identify that the moment of his definition was that afternoon. Some of you, the moments that can define you are two minutes before you come. But you don't even know because you don't see that it is seed time. If Isaac had known what I know, that boy would have cancelled anything for heaven. Let me tell you, in this life, you can have one encounter and it changes your life for good. And the Son of God never won. No, you're closed in doors, he just appears. You never know when you'll have that encounter. You never know when that word will be spoken upon your life and it changes you. All you have to do is to prove to God that I will always be available in seed time. If service begins at 10, be there at 10. And just be available to God. If you come late, don't feel judged. We will not judge you because I don't know where you're from. This is not a point over shaming who came in late because I also don't know why some people came in late because maybe they had challenges in the morning there's somebody maybe who didn't have transport and they came late there's somebody maybe whose parents had refused them to pray and they had to plead with them to let them go there's probably somebody who has given a condition that if you don't do this you're not going to church and they tried to do it and somebody was doing it intentionally to hurt them 
God knows your heart. This is not a point to point at who has entered. This is a point for you to examine yourself according to this truth. Like I said, not everybody who has walked in late intended it. But there are people who just come late simply because you have not yet understood seed time. And God deals with you according to your heart. He deals with you according to your heart. Play in the gospel. You'll have the consequences of a player. Do you understand what I'm saying? Take God serious. You'll be amazed at the things you'll stumble on. Praise God. Take service time serious. Take fellowship serious. Keep time in the house of God. Yes. Yes. If you're not late for an interview, if you're not late for a flight, if you're not late for a date, if you're not late at your workplace, you should not be late in the house of God. Or if you should be late in all, don't be late when it comes to seed time. Don't ever let yourself come late. Don't ever find yourself finding your man of God on the altar. That is disrespectful to the spirit of grace. It's dishonorable to the person of Jesus. That's what Thomas did not know. God breathed on 11 and they received an impartation that was going to carry the history of the church and Thomas missed out. And when Jesus comes to Thomas, he addresses Thomas's unbelief. Touch, you have believed? Yes. But he never spoke to him about what he missed. He never spoke to him about what he missed because sometimes it's late. Sometimes it's late. Sometimes it cannot be reversed. Why? Because it's Rema. For example, come back, I call you in a meeting, oh, I, in service, they, you, call, you mentioned my name as in there, what were you saying? And sometimes I want to tell them, that moment passed. I can't go back and reverse it eh? and somehow make it possible for that moment again to attend to you because that's not how the Son of God works. He's not there to wait for you until you are comfortable. No. You are supposed to wait to him. Banange, let us respect God. Okay, say some words to Jesus. Repent. Speak in tongues. Every crown I ever want, I lay it down. Any praise I ever gave, I give it all to you. For there's nothing in this world that can compare you alone are worthy you alone are worthy you are near to the call upon your name to heaven give and never learn Oh, you open up your hands and satisfy, give you all the glory, give you all the glory, you are worthy, oh, Every 
that you're speaking to us are for our good and help us to honor sweet time. Help us to honor the place of your service to us to show you that we love you and we honor every word spoken by you to us. Even the things that seem simple, they are our life, they are our prosperity, they are our story. They are our redemption, they are our deliverance, they are our strength, they are wisdom. In Jesus' name. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.